Okay, so I think we will get started now. <coughs> so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this virtual conference on advances in 5G evolution and cybersecurity. Uh, in this uh, virtual conference, Dr. David Soldani will talk about the 5G evolution from 3GPPR uh, release 15 enhanced mobile broadband EMBB to the 3GPP release 16 uh, industrial IoT and 3GPP release 17 as well as consumer IoT. So he's going to cover a lot of uh, important topics related to advances in 5G evolution and cybersecurity. Uh, just a little bit of uh, introduction about David. So, uh, uh, David, uh, so uh, Dr. David Soldani is with uh, Huawei uh, Technology. He received a Master of Science degree uh, in engineering with full marks and magna cum laude uh, from the University of Florence in Italy in 1994 and a Doctor of Science degree in technology with distinction from Helsinki University of Technology in Finland in 2006. In 2014, 2016, and 2018, he was appointed the visiting professor, uh, industry professor, and adjunct professor at the University of Surrey, UK, uh, University of Technology, Sydney, as well as the University of New South Wales, respectively. Uh, Dr. David Soldani is currently at Huawei Technology, serving as Chief Technology and Cybersecurity uh, office CTSO in Australia, as well as an ICT expert within the Asia Pacific region. Prior to that, he was the head of 5G technology E2E Global at Nokia and head of uh, Central Research Institute CRI and VP Strategic and Innovation in Europe at Huawei European Research Center. So we have a very uh, distinguished uh, presenter today and uh, please welcome him and uh, he'll give his talk next. So uh, thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction and for hosting me today. And uh, uh, yeah, my experience um, is of more than 25 years in the information communication technology and uh, I have been uh, serving uh, the most at Nokia and Huawei technology, but they were always uh, contributed as an academic. I'm still uh, um, involved and active at university in this particular case at uh, UNSW and uh, thanks so much the uh, UTS uh, for the discussion we are having today. I have organized this uh, uh, presentation. It's about 50 pages into four parts. So we go first through about uh, the 5G. So there is a lot of confusion and I hope I have a chance to clarify the main aspect of uh, architecture and uh, supported uh, uh, technology use cases. Then uh, I'll be talking about the uh, uh, 5G in terms of uh, security requirements. So there are very important requirements, uh, uh, the industry and uh, um, in general uh, has to support. And then I will go through the uh, 5G security uh, standards. So what we are uh, receiving as functionality and requirements for standards. But the most important part is the last one where I will show uh, examples of uh, security uh, deployment. Starting from 5G and its evolution. So as we speak, uh, um, we have uh, 81 commercial 5G networks uh, already deployed in uh, more than 40 countries. And uh, Australia, for example, has already a commercial launch with uh, OptiCenters trying yesterday ahead for uh, VAJ and TPG. So basically TPG now that we launch uh, a few hundred uh, 5G sites uh, by the end of this year. Um, so, as we speak, uh, 5G is on and gear up 
uh, namely uh, we have already commercial networks uh, pretty much all around the world supporting mobility as well as fixed uh, wireless access so fwa stands for fixed wireless access in particular we have registered a massive uh, deployment of uh, the 5g system uh, in china accelerated uh, by the coronavirus pandemic as well as by the anticipated launch and assignment of the spectrum and uh, there are already more than 250,000 nodes uh, deployed connecting more than 60 million so you need to give you just a rough number to understand uh, what we're talking about here uh, we have, uh, let's take an example, UK and Australia. So Australia, around 10,000 sites uh, at, in the C-band would be sufficient uh, to have uh, satisfactory services and coverage uh, all over the country. And 25,000 would serve UK nicely. And here we are already talking about uh, uh, 250,000 with expectation of achieving up to uh, even more than 600 thousand base station by the end of this year uh, bringing connectivity to more than 180 million uh, terminals and uh, so the pandemic has also stimulated and uh, incentivized massive uh, um, development on new applications so it's not just uh, speaking over the, the cellular phone but uh, we have more than as we speak 600 uh, type of uh, service application in the field of okay we have industry application transport medical treatments as I said before uh, we have uh, many application for um, stemming the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic but we are also seeing a massive development deployment of uh, uh, industrial application especially it is uh, about the industrial uh, internet and uh, the other question is uh, at which frequency the system uh, radiates so the, the most important enabler to have uh, an economy of scale and adoption and development and rollout of the 5g system it is the spectrum availability and uh, as of today uh, we have uh, the system mostly deployed in the band the 77 and 78, which is uh, the broad overlapping of this C band. So we're talking about uh, around uh, uh, 3.5 gigahertz and uh, even considering the uh, upper band, we talk about uh, uh, 4 uh, gigahertz. We are also having deployments in the millimeter wave and here you may see the adoption in terms of uh, licensed uh, deployed network as well as uh, investment uh, in the phase of uh, evaluation and uh, we are already talking about uh, more than 173 operators investing in the system and those are the bands uh, mostly utilized for 5G services. As I said, the most uh, in use is the C band, so around uh, three gigahertz, but we also have a massive deployment in millimeter wave. Here you have the ranges. And we are also having utilization of spectrum below three gigahertz. In particular, we do have the TDD uh, deployment at 2.6 gigahertz and then the 700 megahertz that allows not much uh, speed because the band is uh, pretty limited but um, massive uh, uh, connectivity and coverage at 700 megahertz. Then the other question is yes if that is the the system the network what you know more than 100 uh, uh, carriers are deploying the question is do we have the devices do we have an ecosystem so can we really enjoy use uh, these services the, the answer is, is definitely yes so i've just distracted uh, today the later report from uh, gsa you may find behind this link and uh, what we have is that we already 
have mm, 16 announced form factors. So the device is not just about smartphones, but uh, we have the possibility of using uh, 5G on laptops, notebooks, model, CP, like fixed wireless access, routers, gateways, TV, etc. And uh, we have more than 86 vendors uh, who have already announced the availability of uh, the 5G devices. And uh, you may see from those two figure, figures, uh, below is the support spectrum that we, we have already discussed. Uh, and above is the a pie chart that uh, presents the, uh, how those uh, particular devices are distributed. So we have, of course, predominantly is the availability of uh, smartphones, then uh, followed by the CPEs for the fixed wire access, and then we have uh, a number of uh, different models because uh, 5G is, uh, has been designed for uh, bringing uh, services not only to the smartphones, but to anything and, uh, and everything. So what we have today is that the system is ready, the ecosystem is ready, spectrum is ready, and, uh, and 5G uh, is a service uh, already in place. And now I would like to present uh, how the system has been conceived, designed, deployed, but more importantly, how will that evolve so that uh, all the three usage scenarios, which is enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable latest communication services, and, and the massive machine type of communications can be supported. And I'd like to start from uh, uh, the architecture because there is a, a lot of confusion and uh, I think uh, uh, not uh, to too many people still that haven't uh, clear what the 5G is. Somebody think of uh, a general distributed system with uh, no stacking, no ending, whereas it's the system is uh, crystal clear design and uh, copy and paste the architecture already in place for many, many, many years coming from uh, uh, the GSM to G, 3G, 4G, and now we have 5G. So we do have the same type of network design in terms of uh, network domain. We do have a radio access network followed by an accord network and then an independent evolving transport network layer that connects uh, 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 the two uh, network domain. Now, going a little bit more in detail, we talk about two main system configuration, the so-called non-standalone configuration, which is basically a, a 4G system that you can see here. So you have the access network, the long-term evolution or ENOB, so the, the radio access 4G connected to an evolved packet core, which consists of uh, yeah, equipment that take care of the mobility, access uh, of terminal and then a uh, gateway. So that, that's the core. And the first uh, configuration denoted as non-standalone or if you want option uh, three in the different uh, f flavors or a family uh, consists of a 4G network end to end with uh, an addition of a new radio station, which usually it is uh, co-located with the other baseband unit uh, uh, that radiates at uh, 4G, uh, at 4G, and uh, typically the implementation is to have a one box that is multimodal, so that supports any kind of uh, access technology. Very simple. So. The first deployment comes with your option one configuration. That's a 4G system that adds a new radio station, which provides an additional pipe or data, the so-called dual connectivity to the mobile phone that we receive data and signaling through the LTE station. And then in the so-called, the secondary, so secondary very split, so the split communication receives data through a new radio station and in addition uh, from uh, the LTE base station. It's just a pretty much a software upgrade depending on the, the status of uh, 
the hardware of the operator. And uh, here we are. We have your uh, new radio station that uh, radiates and uh, uh, boosts uh, the uh, speed in your mobile phone. That's the first, uh, uh, the first uh, configuration in place. The other uh, uh, configuration we talk about is in its standalone. Standalone means it's a, a fresh end-to-end -end new system and uh, typically uh, consists of a new radio station and the introduction of a 5G core. Now, like Earlier, you see that there's a clear interface that separates the radio axis, uh, independent of the protocol you're using to communicate through the radio interface and the core network. Uh, in its standalone configuration, the interface remains. Actually, it's even, even, even more uh, <laughs> standardized and open because it's also unified. So the first time in history, that we assist at a one interface to any kind of access and uh, connecting terminals. So that means uh, that the 5G core will allow us to handle any type of communication independent of the access, whether the access it is uh, 3GPP standardized, like an evolved LTE or a new radio, or it could be even Wi-Fi through an interworking function. And uh, the standalone, has been standardized already in release 15. So we have the possibility of going forward in a carrier with the deployment on your system, attached to your system or node and your existing core network, which is pretty much a software upgrade of your box. Or we may think of overlaying your system by deploying an adjacent core, which then is connected through a standardized unified interface to either a new radio station or an evolved LT station, which supports exactly the same type of interface to the core network, 5G core. Usually the deployment, it is multi-vendor, which means uh, a carrier for many reasons. One is the security and introduction of redundancy for achieving network resilience as to the different vendor. So they tend to have a, a one vendor that may provide a core network and a part of the access or other vendor that may provide uh, uh, only the access. How the system uh, evolves and will evolve. So if it is clear now how uh, the 5G system uh, looks like, not only in terms of standard, but also how the equipment are designed, developed, and deployed in a multi-vendor scenario. We now try to understand how the system will evolve. And finally, ultimately, uh, we have that uh, all the configuration will converge to the option two in its standalone, which is about the 5G core connected to all new radio stations. So that means, uh, an interface also um, of uh, next uh, generation. How we get there? So if the uh, um, operator of any kind, uh, starting from the option one, so uh, the uh, 4G system decided to move forward in a non-standalone configuration, just attaching the new registration to his existing system, we then had to include in the system and make them coexist uh, an option three that will smoothly refarm towards an option two. So we will assist in two steps, the LT refarming, which is not just about uh, refarming the spectrum to the new radio that supports all, but it's also about retiring the uh, 4G uh, equipment. The other part is, say, okay, look, I am keeping my system as it is, and I'm overlaying that um, step by step, um, also considering how I'm going to use the spectrum radiating and different use casing, a fresh 5G system parallel to that, so that uh, I may have an inter-system endover between the two communication system like it works today between, for example, the 4G system and the earlier generations. In this case, the only communication we are having between the 
two system is via the core network. And finally, refarming the LTE, including spectrum migrating step by step for the devices and achieving an option two, which is uh, the 5G system in its uh, standalone configuration, where both the radio access network and the 5G and uh, sorry, the core are of next generation. Okay, so uh, that's in high level how the system has been designed, conceived, and will evolve. And now I would like to uh, present uh, what the standard has planned uh, to come next. And uh, so we have started uh, talking about 5G from release uh, 15 onwards, and that uh, was already completely finalized in 2018 in, uh, and supported both configurations. So the one I presented earlier in non-standalone and standalone. Now the system uh, will evolve. So we're talking about uh, 5G phase two and then later phase three. 5G phase two is um, associated uh, with uh, the uh, 3GPP release uh, 16. And here you may see the timeline and as we speak the phase two uh so release 16 has been uh, finalized it's been right now right now we have the system uh completely uh, specified so we are expecting six months or more from now having access to the new features and supported functionality then we'll be followed by the release uh, 17 release 17 uh, uh, the content of which has been already uh, agreed uh, um, in December last year or beginning of uh, this year, and uh, the study items uh, completed as well. So we're expecting then uh, the future announcements uh, being finalized uh, next year, and then the new system and feature will be ready in the market as well. Now I'd like to present uh, what is new, what is coming in release 16 and then 17. I mean, there are many, many, many functionalities. So I've just uh, taken a few that were also presented recently by the uh, uh, the CGPP um, delegates, and uh, you may find uh, the supporting documentation uh, just behind uh, the links I have embedded. Uh, in the, this presentation. Now, looking at uh, the release 16, this release has been uh, conceived for or sets the uh, foundation for the industrial IoT. And in practice, it does support, actually enhances ultra reliable low latency uh, communication services because uh, most of them are already supported by the the release 15, like a packet duplication or the um, short uh, time slot to transmit and support. But with the release 16, we have further announce announcements. It does support uh, licensed share and unlicensed spectrum, which is very, 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 very important. It supports private networks, time sensitive networking as an application function, only the Release 17 then will be native uh, uh, time sensitive uh, uh, communication. So the, for the release 16, we, we, we just have a way to um, support the functionality in terms of seeing as an application function to the 5G system supports uh, positioning. And in particular, I would like to stress the fact that uh, the cellular vehicle to X Practically, they are coming with the uh, uh, 3GPP uh, release uh, uh, 16 with the new radio. Although, as I present now, uh, next, uh, something is already supported in uh, 4G. And the system enhances up to six nines the reliability, and uh, in particular, um, provides better MIMO multiple access, multiple sorry, multiple input, multiple auto system, a sort of like of coordinated uh, multipoint uh, transmission. And uh, in addition to those uh, functionalities that are uh, working items, so completed, 
as we speak. And uh, the uh, working group have uh, produced more, actually 25 uh, uh, technical report or study item completed uh, that will pave the way towards the working item in the release uh, 17. And uh, here you have a list of the studies completed and uh, we are talking about non-terrestrial uh, type of network. So where the satellites are not only considered as a backcoding system, but it will be a real access uh, system that complements the cellular uh, technology. In addition to this, uh, we will have the support of multimedia uh, uh, transmission and uh, yeah, local area networks, uh, wireless and wireline convergence uh, will be uh, fully uh, supported coming release uh, 17 and then uh, announcement to positioning and location that uh, basically uh, are introducing what is supported by uh, the next release, that is uh, release 17. And uh, release 17, it is uh, an important uh, um, announcement of the 5G system because it uh, uh, wired the uh, supported uh, ecosystem uh, massively. So the, the target is uh, in high level to move from release 15, supporting and enhancing mobile broadband communications to release 16, to cope with more ultra reliable no latency communication services, and then think of further enhance the system release 17 with uh, bringing connectivity to massive type of communication. And that's why the release uh, 17 will allow us to support spectrum up to 71 gigahertz. So earlier was uh, limited to uh, 52.6 uh, uh, gigahertz. It will also allow us uh, to, con to connect to um, massive uh, machine type of communication, in particular the wearables, industrial sensor and uh, enhanced uh, massive IoT. It will support extended realities, so, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixing the two of them, which uh, much more improved uh, and user experience. And uh, if you look at uh, the um, announcement targeting uh, the industrial IoT, but I would say especially the consumer IoT, in terms of whatever wearable devices, or it could be like uh, healthcare monitoring function, or even uh, um, industrial cameras or cameras for uh, for surveillance. Uh, the uh, TGPP release 16 comes with a uh, new radio light uh, interface. So, so it is a a fresh new uh, protocol to allow those particular communication to access the network in a um, ultra reliable uh, and uh, uh, improved uh, connectivity and uh, communication. So the NR light, um, it is basically represented on this spider diagram where um, we have tried to map all the communication services starting from narrowband IoT, EMTC included, in other words, low power wide area um, IoT devices or LPWA as uh, said, which are already being finalized, which have been, which were finalized already in release 14 back in 2017. And those particular narrowband communication are uh, kept uh, evolving. So they keep evolving even in, 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 in later releases. But in parallel to that, we have then introduced the enhanced mobile broadband communication uh, services. And here you may see the requirements met by the particular protocols in terms of peak data rate, reliability, latency, battery life cost and coverage. 
then you are see coming especially announced in release 16 as illustrated in the roadmap below and then in release 17 we are talking about nr light which is a technology that it's not good extremely good at uh, anything in particular but it does resolve um, pretty much all problems so that's why it targets to be the way to connect uh, millions of devices per square kilometers and here you may see the relative performance compared to the earlier features exciting <laughs> Now, let us see some of the application coming with uh, uh, release uh, 16 and then further announced in uh, release uh, 17. I'm talking about the cellular vehicle 2X. And uh, as we know, this uh, feature um, has been, was introduced and supported by, by the 4G. The case of LTE uh, with the introduction of a side link. Side link means, uh, okay, let, let's look at this system here. You have uh, the radio access network, in particular one base station position here, there's an antennas, and then you have different type of devices. Namely, in this case, you have two different devices. We do have a car and a roadside unit, which the system treats, uh, treats the same then. They have introduced a link, a side, I mean, it's denoted side link because you have up link from the car to the net to down link from the net to the car. So what's, how do we call it? Okay, I go outside, side link. It is the link uh, uh, the, uh, between devices and the PC5 is the interface uh, between devices. So look at LTE, uh, yeah, so the 4G system, already supports the side link, but uh, the application services are especially in the, uh, I mean, in the direction of broadcasting, so public safety. Whereas with uh, the 3GPP release 16 and the new radio introduction in complementing the LTE technology, so there are various configurations, but doesn't matter. We are capable of supporting through the side link, like presented here, not only uh, broadcasting uh, the basic safety messages, but we are talking a real communication between vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to pedestrian, and vehicle to the roadside unit. And uh, the scheduling of this uh, particular uh, uh, interface, so between, uh, I mean, the, the side link, how is that done between the the devices uh, can be either handled by the network in the case uh, we have coverage or in the case of out of coverage has to be pre-provisioned and it is done autonomously by the terminal in a contention based manner. Now that's basically what we will have in release 16. So maybe uh, massive deployment starting uh, and to see a beginning of uh, the next year and then release 17 will further enhance the uh, side link as, as well as we'll introduce the pro proximity services uh, for uh, critical communications and public safety applications. So we are ready then to have any kind of possible scenarios between uh, devices where the network uh, may or may not be uh, there. If it is there, we'll assist into the communication uh, between the peer entities. Just two words, because uh, it is uh, very, very important to understand how the railway system will evolve. Even here, not everybody uh, is aligned in, uh, in, in this direction. So I'm talking about the evolution of the GSMR and the industry, in particular, the International Union of Railways, UIC, uh, and has been broadly agreed that uh, the GSMR will retire by uh, 2030. So you may consider how many kilometers of infrastructure will retire. Now, to know more about this, you just click on this link. 
and you may see the vision that uh, UIC has uh, made available. It's already more than one and a half year ago. And uh, what they did also, they output a very comprehensive uh, specification, so a requirement specification, which is uh, behind this link, uh, which consolidates uh, requirements um, for three type of service, so service categories, performance, uh, business and critical application, which are essential for the train movements and safety or uh, legal uh, obligation. We're talking about emer emergency shunting presence, tracking maintenance, etc. So what is the future <laughs> railway mobile communication system? And this has been already agreed that will be 5G release 16 and uh, 17. And uh, these uh, requirements have been already incorporated into GPP technical specification and uh, it is already available as the specification on the mission critical push to talk services, but also the other important mission critical applications such as uh, video data, and uh, uh, critical services uh, uh, as well. And uh, that will come in release uh, uh, 16 and further enhanced in uh, 5G uh, release uh, 17. So it's uh, very clear, huh? it's a huge, huge investment now because we have about less than, <laughs> less than 10 years time frame to migrate all this uh, amount of infrastructure GSM, so it's basically a, it's, it's a 2G jumping from a GSMR system to a 5G system, release 16 and uh, 17, yeah. And that's for the railway uh, communication of any kind. So that was the, uh, the first part. I will now jump into uh, the security part and uh, and then some example applications. 5G requirements in terms of uh, security. We do have in the industry three main type, uh, sorry, four main type of uh, requirements. Um, and uh, the carrier focus is especially placed on the uh, multi-access age uh, computing, as we show you. So security around the, the deployment of, uh, of the Mac, but uh, there are also some concerns on uh, net slicing. So you may imagine that your physical infrastructure now are accessed not only by a number of uh, uh, devices, terminals, machine of any kind, but there will be also multi-tenant interface that other um, operators or vertical as segments will have access to a network. So there are many, many, many concerns. Then the other concern is the massive connectivity. So the massive and the, 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 the amount of connection to be established uh, and uh, uh, creating a load towards the control plane, user plane, and then the security management. So we need to have a, a very easy way to, uh, uh, to, uh, to go forward towards uh, uh, risk mitigation, uh, transparency and uh, compliances to, to, to laws and regulation that has to be automated as much as possible. And then other requirements are coming from the fact that the system is uh, expected uh, to connect something well beyond mobile phones. So if I am break into a mobile phone, uh, the consequences uh, could be a, a minor concern compared if I am, for example, orchestrating a car, yeah, or um, entering into um, um, the merit of a, a logistic uh, process and, and so forth. So there are, there are more stringent requirements coming from the uh, vertical sector that we need su to support. And I will show you in particular uh, what it means when we deploy the, uh, the Mac for uh, reducing latency between uh, uh, peers. The other type of requirement, uh, extremely important 
and uh, a must now uh, for uh, the vendor to uh, to comply it is uh, the uh, possibility of uh, having in place a uh, uh, well trusted um, security assurance uh, scheme security assurance scheme and uh, we are currently uh, talking about uh, two uh, framework we do have the common criteria which is a well established uh, way of achieving uh, certificates of uh, compliance to certain level of assurance and then now coming uh, uh, importantly uh, for the so the common criteria is especially uh, valid for the information technology so it's in the IT special sector and not really suitable for the uh, although I have, it can be there has to be in place but not really comprehensively designed for the telco sector now for the telco sector we are we, we are we are talking about this ne sas a scas method with the contribution uh, from two organizations gsma and to gpp and i will present uh, uh, this scheme because it is is extremely important and of demand by 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 the carrier so the the vendor need to uh, meet those uh, particular uh, requirements right if we now uh, look at uh, this in general uh, saying high level uh, uh, the main requirements coming from uh, uh, various uh, stakeholders to the 5g system now the question is uh, how do we meet those requirements and i will show you uh, two things how the standards um, uh, comes forward with uh, new mechanisms with respect to the 4g uh, to uh, ensure trustworthy product and resilient networks. And then more importantly, I will show you what it means in terms of uh, security deployment, which is uh, uh, the most important thing. Now, let us look at the uh, 5G system in release uh, 15. Release 15, uh, coming with a new radio to configuration I presented you earlier, introduces already a robust and an excellent security posture compared to the 4G system. I have some functionality that we present to you in the next slide, but at the same time, it also introduces security assurances schemes. And uh, this is particularly true for the 4G announcement as well as the 2GPP network element. Um, evaluation then release 16 and 17 they are uh, further enhancing those uh, um, security uh, characteristics uh, and aspects of the system in terms of assurance so there are new scheme coming applicable uh, to other function especially of the core network in addition to the one already uh, mandated for the uh, uh, release 15 such as uh, assurance scheme for the new data analytics function the interworking function when we talk about connecting to the 5g system through our wi-fi or non 3 gpp uh, trusted uh, type of access then we have service uh, communication proc proxies, uh, security, uh, Ashura and scheme and other uh, um, functionality to be supported. In addition to this, we have uh, many important uh, announcements in terms of uh, security architecture and security enablers for the vertical industry, such as new security scheme for the verticals and 5g LAN supported network slicing i will present you in detail consumer uh, uh, type of uh, iot communication and then we have already uh, schemes in place for authentication and key management for application on top of the 5g system 
So the thinking you know, is of ah, connectivity to something well beyond uh, a smartphone. So it's the internet of things. Okay, then there are other functionalities, uh, equally important, including how we need to handle the deployment of uh, the mobile edge uh, computing platform, as I will show you later. All uh, those details um, summarized uh, uh, in a very high level uh, on this slide can be found uh, beyond this link and all the technical specification, say the 33 series dot X, Y, Z, R technical specifications for 5G security and security assurance. So the X, if X is five, those are the technical specification for 5G and the rest you may, you may guess what they are. Yeah, um, looking at the quick comparison of what is supported by the 4G system compared to what comes already in 16 and, and uh, 15, sorry. Uh, for the 5G, we have that, uh, in short, the, uh, yeah, the key for the encryption will be uh, double at a later time, but more importantly, what we have that uh, 5G supports integrity protection at uh, radio interface, which was not uh, uh, possible before uh, release uh, 15. We do have also support of, uh, uh, privacy because the uh, international mobile subscriber identity is concealed, so is uh, encrypted since the very beginning uh, during the uh, registration, so the establishment of the communication from the terminal. So we have privacy in place, which was not the earlier. Uh, yeah. Then, in addition to this, we have the possibility of setting policy uh, well beyond the network level, so we could really discriminate how we want to have the security deployed and the corresponding policy at the uh, better level, slicing level at, at the communication level, because with the 5G, we are able to discriminate down to the single packet. So the five tuplet, which are uh, the, uh, the flows of uh, the packets uh, traversing our network. Then in addition to this, we have uh, the 5G introduces a unified way of authenticating uh, the access uh, uh, to the network that is uh, independent of the type of access. As I mentioned earlier, this is the first time in history that we will have a 5G core, a core network that will allow us a unified authentication independent of the type of access. That could be like uh, a 4G access, 5G access, or a Wi-Fi through an interworking function, meaning that we have now a unique way, a unified way, a global way of uh, identifying both the subscription and the terminal equipment, and therefore providing the corresponding peers uh, access uh, and encryption as security. In addition to this, we have the introduction of encryption between the uh, network domains so that even in the roaming case, when the traffic crosses a visiting and, uh, and a homing network, the, uh, the data is uh, practically encrypted. So that's just to give you a view of how many more things are coming in uh, the first deployment of 5G in its standalone configuration, standalone configuration when you deploy a 5G core. So the 5G core is more secure than running your traffic through uh, 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 an evolved packet core where there's no enhancement <laughs> in terms of security. You see many contradiction, people talking about many things. So the real robustness and posture of the 5G communications in all terms, encryption, key management, authentication, and security deployment, it is further enforced through the introduction of the 5G core. Now, I would like to answer uh, to the question is yes, but how do we ensure and we provide the uh, security assurance, security assurance, and I would like to cover a little bit in detail what the uh, uh, GSMA together to GBP are doing 
in terms of achieving ultimately uh, having uh, uh, um, an organization that will use those schemes for providing uh, um, a certificate. So use those uh, reports coming out through this uh, particular process to then achieve uh, via uh, an accredited uh, um, uh, organization, uh, uh, um, a certified authority, uh, uh, a certificate. So I'm talking about the any SANS and 3GPP discussing. What is it in practice? So what we're talking about here, it is uh, an industry defined and uh, a voluntary scheme that uh, the vendors through uh, which uh, uh, they will, uh, they are basically um, evaluating uh, their uh, products in terms of uh, development life cycle. And at the same time, they do uh, evaluate uh, the uh, network equipment uh, uh, support functionality in terms of uh, uh, security. The functionality I presented to you earlier, I example of what is evaluated uh, through the equipment uh, evaluation and uh, practically the any SAS stands for network equipment security assurance uh, scheme it is defined by the uh, two uh, most important organization industry organization uh, in the um, mobile communication industry so GSMA that is the association of the the carrier and the CGPP you know that they are assembling uh, the most important standardization body that they are responsible for the uh, definition, the technical specification, which are then transposed by the corresponding SDO, so the standardization uh, body like Etsy, or I was, for example, I am still in Singapore supporting uh, the government, the IMDA transposes the, the, those uh, particular specification into, into standards. So these two organizations together, they are now providing an industry-wide security assurance framework that uh, facilitates and improves the security level across the old mobile industry. So that's basically uh, an auction that uh, meets uh, the requirements, the third categories of requirements uh, are presented early. And in practice, uh, the NSAS consists of uh, two main schemes. We have the uh, security requirements as assessment uh, for achieving secure product development, actually for evaluating, auditing, that uh, the vendor has a secure product development and product life cycle process. So let me look at how you make the products and how you handle the life cycle, how you manage your life cycle, your product. That's the first question. Let me have a look at that, yeah? The second, once I have audited, how you make those products and how you maintain across the whole life cycle all those uh, uh, um, uh, act, uh, the process you are having. I want to have a look at your network equipment. I hope it's clear this. Yeah, first let me see uh, how you do things, and then I will want to see into what you have done. Yeah, and the what is means uh, they they are defining the security evaluation schemes for the network equipment and the evaluation is based on the 3GPP standard. Yeah, nothing else. So as we speak, uh, they are already available and uh, uh, the specification for the process, we are talking about the uh, NE SARS uh, 1.0 and that was already approved and finalized and frozen last, last year in October. And this is already ongoing, so we have Nokia, having uh, going through this process, Ericsson, Huawei, I will show you about our organization, what they've done. And uh, let us understand uh, uh, what is it a little bit in detail and uh, the, corresponding, the corresponding responsibility between uh, uh, the two organizations. So look at this uh, um, slide, and in particular, uh, this house here, you have the, uh, fundam the fundamentals are here below, and then you have the upper part. The upper part, it is within the scope of GSMA. So they are responsible of uh, producing the network equipment security assurance schemes. So we do have an overview out of which I've extracted this presentation. 
but they also they have uh, finalized uh, three type of uh, specifications. So the one dealing with the security test laboratory accreditation, the requirements, the process. Then we have the uh, vendor development and product uh, life cycle assessment methodology. And uh, uh, the last part is about the vendor development and product life cycle security requirements. So that's within the scope of the GSMA that GSMA basically defines and maintains this any SaaS uh, uh, specification and it is also responsible of uh, the dispute resolution uh, if anything happen. And you may see here how the organization it is uh, positioned in terms of uh, governance and the scope of the specification. So that's within the responsibility of the GSMA. And then 3GPP complements that by providing the technical specification for a security assurance requirement and assurance methodology for the products. And what we are talking about here is uh, what I have already presented are the security assurance specifications. So this CAS uh, in 3GPP, a technical specification 33.x, which I've shown you earlier and uh, uh, later I have an example summary of uh, what it is currently adopted by the GSMA. This slide taken by the first document, uh, so the roof of the house I presented uh, earlier, I presents in high level the uh, process and uh, uh, it consists as I said two parts. So the first part is about the assessment of the security related to the development of the uh, product and uh, the product life cycle processes. And the second is about uh, the evaluation of the network equipment uh, themselves by test laboratory. And here you may see the scheme, you have the different uh, players and uh, in the different roles, so you have the GSMA is here, 2GPP is here, the, van, the mobile operator is here, so that's the ultimate beneficiary of uh, this work, also receiving uh, the reports in, the, in terms of evaluation and auditing of the process. And then you do have the equipment vendor that is uh, a volunteer into going through uh, this process in terms of auditing and in terms of uh, tests and uh, evaluations. Now, uh, in this uh, process, uh, we are not delivering a, um, a certificate that requires a certification authority, a credit part that's going to come next. What we're having here is our uh, report in terms of auditing and evaluating the network equipment that will be then adopted by the corresponding authorities. So where are we today? But before uh, showing that, it, this is just an example of the technical specifications in use while evaluating the different uh, equipment by the test laboratories. And uh, that's the list currently in use by the, the scheme uh, 1.0. And I've just uh, opened up one of those uh, uh, technical specifications where you may see the level of details how the radio access network, so the RAN, the denoted as Gino B, but it is the radio access network, the base station, uh, the 5G base station, it is practically um, assessed. So in order to verify that all the, uh, the corresponding functionality, uh, the standard demands are truly support and meet the TGP requirements. So it's very, very, very detailed. So like here, they, they look into detail, they are RRC integrity, they use the print integrity, etc. cetera. Um, so very, 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 very detailed process. And that would then uh, output uh, um, a report that basically um, um, allows uh, the carrier, so the recipient of uh, the product having um, assurance that the particular product can be trusted. Yeah, can be trusted. 
Then how to achieve a resilient network, it is uh, the next level of the security which I'm presenting uh, in the last part of this presentation. So where are we today? So we, we have already in place the NSAS uh, 1.0, finalized last year in October, and the NSAS uh, 1.0 uh, supports the basic requirement uh, coming from the European Commission, in particular, the EU Cybersecurity Act, which defines three level of assurance. We have the basic, we have a substantial and a high and the corresponding evaluator. So basics can be, uh, an evaluation can be performed by the, the vendor themselves. So it's self-assessed. Then substantial with third party and then high uh, means that the National Cybersecurity Certification Authority must be involved. So the target here is that uh, the industry is now collaborating with the agency, ENISA, European Commission, in order to uh, adopt and adapt the ENISA's uh, process in order to achieve to achieve the um, or realize the uh, certification uh, scheme. And then later, uh, the NSS now is under discussion and uh, what is in the phase of agreement that there will be, the technical specification will be further expanded. And by the end of this year, uh, the NSS 2.0 should be able also to incorporate a penetration test, a cryptographic analysis and uh, a software engineering, uh, meaning um, having in place requirements and a methodology to analyze the quality of uh, the software. So it is a scheme, uh, as we speak, uh, well uh, re received and um, broadly adopted, adopted by the carriers, uh, as you have modern tech carriers demanding for having uh, the equipment um, validated uh, uh, through these schemes in terms of auditing, but also in terms of network equipment assessment. You have uh, ongoing discussion and collaboration with uh, a number of security authority. I just mentioned in ESA in Europe, the BSO in Germany and the ANSI in France. And then, uh, okay, the process has been driven initially by Ericsson and then uh, uh, coming along together, the vendor Nokia and uh, Huawei, just to mention uh, a few. And then looking at the auditors and the laboratory accreditation for those two processes, what we have is that the GSMA has already selected two laboratories for uh, performing the auditing task. And then we have more than 10 laboratories now being accredited uh, to uh, release this uh, report for evaluating the net equipment and uh, GSMA is a very strict. This is uh, something that uh, the uh, test laboratory has to comply. Basically, they need to be accredited by the ILAC, which stands with the International Laboratory, Laboratory Accreditation Corporation. And uh, it requires that uh, the particular laboratory complies with the ISO um, 70,025, and it is accredited. And in particular, it supports all the NSAS uh, requirements. So the process widely supported, already ongoing. And uh, I will show you what uh, Huawei, but also other organizations uh, have already attained. Now, there are many questions we receive usually say, okay, yeah, we, have, we talk a lot about common criteria. And uh, why don't we use just common criteria or what's the difference between the this scheme, uh, the uh, GSMA and TGP are proposing now compared to the, the common criteria. So as I said, the common criteria has been in place for many years already. And uh, they are uh, especially designed for achieving uh, a level of certification um, within the IT industry. And uh, it's a lengthy process, may for, an, in, for example, for an evaluation assurance level, four may require from one year to 18 months. So imagine, how much delay they would introduce to launch the new product. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really a lot of work. Some of the equipment must go through common criteria. Others common criteria are not truly suitable. For example, for the, uh, the base station and, and uh, 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 of uh, 5G or the 
um, in general of the mobile uh, system. That's why we're thinking of uh, the NSA scheme, which is a much simpler process, really efficient and effective in its evaluation, and they usually last maximum uh, six months. Now, when we look at the details of uh, the evaluation of the process for uh, making a product and uh, life cycle management of product, you compare the two, uh, two things, what we have is that in the one hand, we have that uh, for the auditing process, the NE SAS 1.0 is already better than common criteria. So you see here, comparing one by one, the requirements coming from NE SAS and what will be practically supported by the common criteria. On the other hand, when we look at the contents of equipment evaluation and tests, so the NE SAS is not yet ready to look at uh, the um, compliance towards penetration tests, so-called scans, so the uh, software engineering and then uh, uh, cryptographic algorithm implementation analysis and, uh, for example, how the random number are generated or what kind of algorithm for encryption are uh, supported. Not ready yet, so in this sense, uh, the common criteria for the range of products uh, they've been designed for are uh, more advanced and the targets now to complement the NSAS 1.0 so that by the end of this year, we uh, have also those schemes uh, supported by the NSAS for the uh, 5G products or in general, uh, mobile communication systems. Right. So examples of uh, certificate, just to say, yeah, but um, where, where are we today and what, what your organization has done? Yeah, just as a quick summary, we have that, for example, Huawei has already attained a number of those uh, uh, certificate. I think uh, for this presentation, it is a relevant that the 5G RAM and the 5G core have completed uh, the first in SAS audit, uh, um, evaluation and uh, they are now subject to the SCAS test. So for the equipment evaluation should be ready uh, both for core and run by the end of this year for then a massive uh, uh, network uh, rollout and uh, compliance to the carriers that are demanding for having uh, passed those uh, tests. At the same time, we have other uh, certificate attained, especially for the core network, which include common criteria, because as you know, the, uh, the, the core network, it is largely uh, virtualized. It's pretty much uh, an IT system. Overall, uh, Huawei has attained more than 270 certification. Now we go, without going into the details, uh, yeah, there are certificates um, for security uh, of products, but there are also certificates uh, looking at the security management system. So intended to see how the organization uh, implements uh, uh, and achieves information security. Information means data, yeah? That's uh, what is information. Information equal data, yeah? Data security the quality management uh, of system and the supply chain, how the particular organization uh, handles the supply chain. So before achieving the uh, end product and then a qualification on information and uh, security. Okay, we are now going, I think in the most interesting uh, part, uh, it is the how we uh, can really become uh, resilient to any kind of uh, threat, attack, that could be from external organization, but it is especially true for, for, for internal organizations. Uh, the owner, so the one that they have the hands-on, they have the hands-on, they are using, they are using the infrastructure, the one that they have, they have, they have access to data, because they, let, let, let me say that they, there are three uh, categories of information or data. So there is a data at rest, data at rest that you put in, you store them, you archive them. Yeah, data that's at rest, stay there in some place, you put it there. Then there is data in transit that we, we send from A to B and then returning from B to A. So that's transit. And then we have data in use. So we do have very uh, important method to mitigate um, threats, risks for data at rest 
uh, in transit, but it's very difficult to do anything for the data in use. That's why, that's why the, the, the owner of the, the, um, of the equipment, the, the, the owner in the sense that the, the one that operates, that has access, it's very, that's the, the where we need to pay most the attention to because it is the data in use. The data in use are not very easy, easy to, uh, uh, to protect. For example, like I'm now watching this scheme and uh, it is a screen and uh, if this screen contains uh, any kind of secret information, it could be like a right management system that I cannot print, I cannot copy, I cannot do it, but I can take my, uh, what is it here? I take my, uh, sorry, where this one? Yeah, I take my uh, phone, yeah, and then I take a picture, done. So this is data in use, I can do anything about this. So, so that, that the cybersecurity is deployment, it's a long process, and also the people has to be selected properly, educated, in order to achieve uh, a trustworthy system and a, a resilient network, but also it is important that the people behave and know how to behave uh, within the organization. Said this, we can think of data trust and data in transit now, that is the focus of this presentation and look at the possible uh, solution to uh, security deployment. So let's look at this slide. How much time we have? Yeah, we still have some time. So looking at this slide, I've organized uh, this slide in terms of uh, the practical domain of the network. So we have the, the, the devices, device of any kind, they're here. This is the device. Then you have the 5G radio access network, which is here. Then we have the 5G core, which is here. We clear interface, separation, everything, it's here. Then we have the transport network layer, that will run allow us the communication between these two domains. Good. Then we have the data network or external data network, including the internet or an internet, or it could be even a, an enterprise network that we want to connect. Then we have the management system and the, and the Mac, the Mac. So the, yeah, also the Mac is a lot of confusion where it's extremely simple. The mobile edge computing platform, it is seen by the 5G system as an application function. Nothing else. You see how the blurs here, yeah, there's all bullshit. The blurs, no blurs, no blurs anybody here. Everybody, it's crystal clear what is his name, where it is, where it is. This, this, that's, that's it to a similar the Mac, it's just an application function. So if it wants to watch, access, the carrier network must go through a user frame function, which is a function of the core network. That's it, full stop. From the system perspective, it's nothing else than an application function of the network. But there are threats. Yeah, there are many threats. I'll show you how to mitigate them. There are many threats. So looking at the threats, we have many threats uh, uh, at the, uh, in, in the radio access network from fake base station, we have threats to the radio interface, denial of service of any kind. Then the Mac, I will show you more in detail. Yeah, there are threats because one of the reasons is that the Mac will be brought physically close to the age. Age, age, also age in a confusion. Let me define the age once forever. Age is anything around the end user. So if I'm in the end user with my phone, that's my phone. The age is what is coming next to me. So in this particular case would be the base stage. Yeah, that's my age of the network. The other age will be attached to what it lives, what it connects to the core network. Now, the, looking at the, uh, the Mac, the, 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 the need of the Mac is that it has to perform many things. Um, one of the things it has to perform is to reduce latency. So I cannot put, put far from the age because this, the speed of the light, uh, if I want to stay like say below one millisecond two ways, I cannot go beyond 150 kilometers. I cannot do that. So I'm usually 10 people. So we also have an element of physical security that if I have to place this uh, um, server platform proxy and the corresponding applications, I would have external people 
access in the area and therefore we also have some problem. And then the core network, we all have the problem uh, of the cloud in general because it's a service-based uh, oriented architecture. Cloud native and all the functions, which are functions. So we have the corresponding threads. And then of course, we have external threads of external attacks that may come from uh, all over the places. And then also we need to mitigate access uh, uh, to the network in terms of uh, uh, network management uh, at any level, especially for slicing where you are opening up uh, your uh, assets, your assets to multi-tenant that uh, they can do anything and everything uh, within the limits, uh, but uh, uh, to compose the function so they, they create definitely a threat to your infrastructure. Now, the conclusions we have achieved uh, globally, uh, globally means uh, not only the industry, but also the governments, regulators, and the application providers that the, 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 the cyber uh, space, so cyber security in general, it is an effort that, uh, uh, that expands across uh, all domain and it is a duty of all of us to behave and uh, uh, put in place uh, the right measures and mitigation in order to achieve trustworthy products in the one hand, on the other hand, resilient system and services. And uh, this is particularly true for uh, confidentiality and integrity of the information, but especially the availability that when I need something has to be there, not, not down, not down. And that means uh, the role of different organization could be a uh, position like uh, I've put on this slide. So we do have the vendor, uh, they do have strong responsibility and vendor must output uh, trustworthy products, trustworthy product and the compliance with the NE SAS goes into that direction. Actually, it is one of the few, a few, uh, or one of the many, sorry, one of the many, that truly, truly uh, uh, proves the trustworthiness of the, the, the network element in compliance with the 3GPP uh, requirements. On top of it, even more importantly, we have the, the carrier, the operator. So they are, they are the real responsible all these games because they, the operator is the main responsible. They are the owner. They are the owner of the infrastructure they are the owner of the services they provide and they are responsible of the security deployment. Imagine that I am providing a, a radio access uh, unit, so this is radio unit, active antennas, yeah, this box here, this box here, this is the BBU. That's the, the core network, another box. That's the BBU, that's the Mac. Uh, it's just a uh, Huawei implementation. So the BBU is here, it's a multi-mode, could be 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, just soft upgrade. That's, that's, the, that's the box. If I give this box, that this box supports any kind of functionality. So I say through the radio interface, encryption, um, integrity, uh, authentication, authorization, all of them for uh, verifying um, and blocking uh, the denial of service attack, anything. But if the carrier does not enable them, uh, what is it? Is that to blame the vendor or is that? Yes. So it is essential to have the mechanism in place, but more important is the security deployment. That is uh, all the uh, procedure processes and uh, um, compliances, mechanisms, responsibilities, duties to have that in place so that the system becomes resilient. Resilient means that the threat and respond to any kind of attack. Yeah. Above this, we have the application themselves. So you may have a fantastic transportive product within a network, and then what you do, you start navigating and you, you are mistaken in inputting uh, your uh, uh, data, like here, yeah, pay, credit card, credit card to the wrong website. So basically what you do here is uh, you go to a website, there's no certificate, so if it is no certificate, there's no digital signature, there's no encryption between these two points, you put your data there and, uh, and uh, basically, uh, yeah, 
you have basically violated <laughs> the basic security principle. So what we need to have in place um, over the top are also the mechanisms such as uh, the possibility of being authenticated, the possibility of uh, encrypting uh, our traffic and uh, verifying, verifying that is, that service is really available. Like if the certificate that is showing the website, is that valid? Or for how long is valid? So I, I have the, the, the application layer has the responsibility of providing secure services and uh, meeting CIA uh, requirements in terms of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the services. And then we have the standard organization, which I've already discussed <laughs> for one hour. Uh, they're responsible for many things, but equally responsible are the government and the regulators that they output uh, two type of uh, let me call uh, documents. Uh, one are the laws and the, the other one are the uh, regulations. The regulation applies to the industry, and the law applies to anybody. And uh, yeah, and um, this is extremely important to have in place the right uh, laws and the regulatory framework so that uh, um, we have mechanisms for uh, um, defining uh, clear requirements, but also uh, methodologies uh, in place so that we are achieving uh, a large degree of uh, compliances, uh, even targeting the safety. So from security to safety of a particular country. Now, so this, I mean, rushing through the uh, um, a few deployment aspects and uh, uh, what I'm presenting uh, cannot be generalized. Yeah, it's, this is something that comes from uh, from our organization, come from Huawei. So how Huawei uh, um, cope with and solve uh, a certain problem. And what I'm presenting, it's not comprehensive, so it's not exhaustive. It's just an example to get a flavor of how certain things can be. Uh, can be done or how certain threats and risk can be uh, mitigated uh, by uh, a security deployment. In particular, we will look at the 5G security deployment. First, this slide is already introducing uh, pretty much all the elements. So as I said, that your system has to be uh, aligned as to comply with the standard, must have in place all the mechanisms I tried to introduce today. And then here is uh, just a, a summary of those, I guess, to support protection, integrity, and so forth. So standard compliance is necessary. And uh, uh, the NESAS, the process I, I showed you earlier, it gives you a chance of uh, having uh, uh, something uh, compliant with uh, those particular requirements coming from the GSMA and to GPP, but that's just, that's just the minor part. If you really want to achieve um, an intelligent, uh, in-depth, end-to-end security uh, solution, you need many more uh, enhancements to that. And uh, we are talking about equipment security. I will show you how you can make equipment uh, secure. You need to have uh, mechanisms, functioning, functionality to secure your subdomain, like how you secure your RAN system, your call network, how do you make your Mac secure for all stakeholders, how you ensure that uh, uh, security is supported by your slices that cannot be compromised. And then how do you cope with the massive connectivity? Now we're talking about millions of connections per square kilometers, so user and control, how you do it? We need to have also proprietary solution. And then, importantly, that's one of the first requirements I present to you, how do you handle all this complexity? So finally, it's not just about being certified. That's not the point. So certification, it is like, uh, the CA stamp of a product entering the union. You need to go towards a risk mitigation framework, risk mitigation framework, adaptive risk framework, and therefore you need to have the means and the methods in place 
that you are performing your task uh, in, in a way that it is as autonomous or automated uh, as possible. And here we are talking about uh, how you will handle your equipment, so the uh, equipment management system, but I think more importantly, how you look at the, the, the system end to end or your own security control zone in a very agile manner. And here we're talking about uh, um, security operation centers. And I will show you later that will we'll, we'll help you go through uh, um, the identification, the protection, to uh, the detection, how you intend to respond to certain attacks and threats, and then how you would recover if something happened to your end-to-end -end system. End-to-end -end system for you is your security control zone. Okay, quickly through equipment security. And what Huawei does for equipment security, the first thing is to achieve a separation of the three planes. So we're talking about the control plane, user plane, data plane. And the separation is not just logical here, it is uh, physical. So our implementation, the equipment, like taking the run and the core here, has been done that we do separate this stacks. So each protocol stack, control plane, user plane, data plane, has its own corresponding logical IP address, but also physical port, it's separated. So it means that if you, attack or you tamper one of, of the, the planes, the other one is not affected. In addition to this, we support encryption end-to-end. -end. Different type of encryption is uh, applied to the different type of uh, traffic. For example, traffic towards the OSS, so management traffic is encrypted using the, the, uh, the transport layer security, uh, TLS uh, uh, encryption. Then we have uh, IPsec tunnels, for carrying the control plane, similarly the user plane, which are separated. So separation of the three planes is essential. I would say separation now coming of the four planes, because we will have also the uh, machine learning pipelines coming in parallel to that, that would require and demand for separation as, as well. So separation and uh, isolation is uh, the password that we need to have uh, for each network element. The other important thing, it is uh, to achieve a trusted execution environment so that you have a secure device or network element uh, operation. So you need to achieve this trusted execution environment, what, what it means that I need to have 100% control of what I'm doing on that particular equipment element where my hardware is uh, located. And what, what we does here, uh, we have three basic steps and uh, uh, all done at chip level. And it is at chip level that is burned the root key, the root key for the, the mother of the encryption. And therefore we have the possibility of uh, uh, encrypting uh, the data in that particular at rest, but also we have the possibility of exchanging certificates and digital signature in the software that we upload. So there is no way to uh, um, uh, mistake the source of code and its origin carried with a digital signature and the corresponding uh, certificate. We do also have a possibility of having real time and a remote attestation of what happened within the execution environment where we have the possibility of verifying the software the firmware uh, during the setup so the system uh, uh, start up and therefore we can immediately and prevent any kind of uh, malicious action that could come to the software or hardware or any, or any kind of uh, compromise and finally we provide a secure operation so that the, all the sensitive function will run and will be executed in a very well dedicated, isolated security control zone, security control zone. I will show you what it means within the core network, just in, as an example. The other important thing is that uh, we need to achieve in terms of equipment security is the uh, intrusion detection uh, um, system. So we, we need to have an intrusion detection system uh, within our uh, uh, network. What is it about? Practically means 
the possibility of supporting uh, native agents that uh, allow uh, you to analyze what happened uh, within the network elements. So here you have example, the, uh, the uh, Huawei ISAC, which is uh, an intrusion detection system that uh, uh, allows the support of a uh, uh, native agent uh, within the node B, so within the radio access routers, and then in the transport network access network, OS as well, and then within the um, virtual network, so the, it, it, this is particularly true for the core network, the possibility of monitoring uh, within a container virtual machine, the, what, what happened to the hypervisor, on which your virtual machine run in the corresponding container. That is making possible in practice to scrutinize, to have transparency uh, within uh, your network element, within your uh, security control zone, or, or what happened and uh, uh, detect uh, any kind of attack. So this is an example of our OS attack. Uh, um, the attack chain is uh, practically supported. And uh, also you have on this slide, an example of container virtual machine attack chain uh, detection into four steps from discovery the vulnerability down to uh, the escape container, the virtual machine and so forth from, and above from investigation and exploit uh, the exploitation of vulnerability uh, and, and an understanding of whether anything has been implanted in terms of the malicious codes and then evidence detection and then more action uh, to be taken so that the corresponding um, problem can be uh, mitigated and resolved. Now, looking at the security domain, we have a uh, different type of uh, uh, mechanisms in place to uh, um, uh, achieve uh, security deployment. This is an example of the radio access network. Again, our algorithm functionality supported by, by the Huawei, I believe other vendor uh, uh, should have those capability and the operator uh, must, must uh, um, enable them uh, in their network to make the network resilience. So the possibility of identifying whether it has been deployed a uh, rag based station, uh, we do have algorithms that analyze the Endova success rate. So if you have a lot of failures here, here you have a problem. It means that uh, there is somebody <laughs> that pretends uh, uh, being a, a base station to uh, capture uh, your traffic, it can be detected easily. The other thing is the protection of uh, the traffic that across this, uh, the radio access network. In this case, we, we, we must enable and support all the PDCP. So that's uh, the convergence protocol at the radio interface that you need to support the uh, encryption as well as uh, the integrity protection of the radio interface. In addition to this, uh, our radio access uh, system, it allows the encryption of the communication uh, towards the core network and the corresponding management uh, uh, player, including the support of the carrier public key infrastructure framework, the certificate, so that we know uh, uh, and uh, we validate uh, uh, and uh, authorize uh, the particular traffic uh, uh, or uh, access uh, uh, to, to the network. The core network, it is a service-based architecture, so cloud-oriented native system. And it looks like here, you have a network function a virtualization infrastructure, a virtualized infrastructure platform on which you have different function the network from supporter slicing, repository function, uh, policy control function, uh, user data management, uh, unified data management function, that, that's where the data are practically stored. And then you have encryption, et cetera. So that, that, that is basically subject to uh, a number of threats. So the threats could come from outside. So from other network, including uh, other uh, visited public and mobile network, the internet, but especially coming, say, from the OS, the, the, the OS in proper access to the network and uh, from the radio interface. So how do we prevent and mitigate this kind of attacks? It's just an example of three, three solutions. So the first is to introduce the hardening models that expose high-risk attack surface. So that means uh, 
we avoid that the traffic reaches out immediately the logic model. We need to uh, uh, prevent that we have uh, an immediate access uh, uh, to the kernel, the most important part of uh, your functionality. And we can introduce like an interface model as well as perform some tasks during the person and then analyzing of the traffic inbound traffic. The second action, it is uh, equally important is to uh, provide isolation. Isolation and uh, it's uh, usually hierarchical depending on the level of security you wanna have in your network domain. For AM zone to a trusted zone here, you have an example to the service domain, therefore to the trust zone of your core network. This particular case, you may introduce a firewall, even virtual firewall as well as uh, that you perform an access uh, control and the gates gating so that each uh, compartment uh, of your core is uh, basically isolated from uh, the other part of the core that you consider more um, uh, important uh, to, be, uh, to be secure. And then of course, uh, the element has to uh, support the uh, diversity and uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, distributing this function in a number of uh, cloud platform. In this case, you would introduce diversity, diversity of the function that if something goes wrong in one part of the system, so that particular access mobility function has a problem, is it has been basically uh, uh, put together, uh, um, uh, uh, working together with another function. So this particular function can be relocated and another function can take over what is practically no longer working uh, uh, in the, the other equivalent function of the network. So we need to introduce diversity at the logical level, so multiple logical functions perform the same task as well as possibly use also different physical elements. And you need to have the software that uh, orchestrate and uh, makes that possible that one thing goes down, availability is still in place because something else is coming up. Yeah, and that has to be supported and enabled by the operator. Now, the mobile age computing platform is introduced later, it's a very hot topic. And uh, yeah, there are uh, a few threats that can be mitigated. There are practically two, two possible deployments. So how, how do I use this, uh, this box, which is a box? Yeah, uh, I presented uh, the what we designed earlier. How am I using it? The, the problem is that this box has to be going very close to the other elements of the access system. So if we think of a, a scenario with a carrier aggregation, in a carrier aggregation room where you may find more than 100 base station, we, we, we do have some problem. We have a problem with location because uh, when the people will access uh, this part of the network, we also have the possibility of seeing and, and touching other equipment you don't want this particular organization to, to see. So that's, that's a problem, it's called physical security. So you need to think how to, to mitigate that and it is practically, uh, practically possible. The other problem is, is uh, coming with the different interfaces. So remember, anytime we want to go towards all run, open run, we want to open everything. The more you open, the more interface you create, the, 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 the possible threats do rise exponentially. Yeah. If in the one end, you may think of diversifying the supply chain with more vendors, which I doubt it, because you, you, the ultimate buyer would need to deal with so many people you don't want to do this. On the other hand, you choose many interfaces. So like the Mac, it's coming along with three main interfaces. Let's look into this interface. So this box basically hosts application functions that could come from third party. It has to work and connect to the user plane function of the operator. Yes, because it's an application function of the 5G system, nothing else. And you have that the enterprise network has to communicate through the carrier network. So there's an exposure possibility of having an access from the carrier network down to the enterprise network that uh, we don't want. So those are examples of problems 
we may have uh, uh, by introducing the mobile age computing platform, it can be mitigated. So the, 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 the two uh, basic threats I introduced earlier, it can be mitigated if uh, we always need to perform an access control. When you do an access control, you mean you need to uh, authenticate, you must authenticate anything that counts to you. You need to authenticate it. So that's the first thing. There are mechanisms to do that. Once you introduce the authentication, you need to think of authorizations. Okay, ah, that's you, yes, but you are only able to do A, B, C, and that not D, you cannot do it. So you need to authorize it. And then you need to have accountability. Accountability means that if something happened, I need to be able to trace uh, everything in place that I can reconstruct identify the root cause of any problem. Yeah, that can be done, can be put in place. And in the particular DMAC, we are thinking of introducing firewalls and mechanisms I present you for slicing so that uh, the uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the corresponding information, the three players, uh, that could be uh, the one I mentioned here, the, the application provider, the Mac uh, platform provider, the could be or cannot be an operator, and then you have the enterprise uh, system. This is an example that uh, explains how to uh, protect the Mac platform from uh, uh, third party applications. And uh, you have uh, concerns coming from the carriers because you have application now coming close to your core network. You, you are basically touching upon the user print function of, of the carrier. And then you have the third party concerns uh, because the third party basically uh, comes along with application, but also with data. They could expose interfaces to something that could come along the, uh, the carrier network. And here you have example how uh, these particular threats uh, could be mitigated, slicing. Uh, net slicing comes uh, already in release 15. It is a function, especially enabled by the core network. It is the 5G. Okay, there are tricks to slice the network even uh, a 4G system, but that, that's not the point. Eh? So the real slicing comes with the introduction, the 5G core. And slicing is about a composition of uh, network function or network slice instances end-to-end. Uh, um, -end. So that means uh, chaining, binding a uh, function of the core network and then create awareness in the radio access network uh, through proprietary algorithm. And then you need to make the terminals aware, slices aware. And now the terminal can support are up to eight different slices so that uh, each terminal may be then camp and uh, uh, use services of the corresponding uh, slice once it is authenticated and authorized to use that particular slice. So practically, we may see that there's a virtual network end-to-end -end designed for, uh, composed, uh, put together uh, for achieving and serving a particular uh, use scenario. In this particular case, we are talking, for example, of uh, slides for enhanced mobile broadband traffic, another slide for um, massive machine type communication, and then another one for ultra religious communication services. Practically, I have virtual networks end-to-end -end making use of the same in physical infrastructure. Therefore, it is a multi-tenant uh, problem where you do have a net slice template, which is pretty much using a web type of interface. Uh, that uh, a third party can uh, compose use network uh, based on service level agreement. Say, okay, I want to connect cars. I want to connect robots. I don't need to buy the infrastructure. I just uh, subscribe uh, uh, to a carrier that exposes uh, those capability uh, in its own marketplace uh, through a web interface, start composing my, and then I, I, I do, yes, this are the SLA, this is what I want, including performance in terms of latency, availability, and I say, okay, yeah, purchase it, and then you buy it, and then uh, the service, it is uh, uh, embedded, the different function are embedded and enforced, and then the control plane uh, establishes those particular communication through uh, um, 
a number of instances across uh, the whole network. So there, there are many problems here. If you think in practice, you have a multi exposure to, to, to tenant. So you have a management interface you need, to, you need to think of to make that secure. You have problems of having an end user uh, attempting to access uh, more slices. I would like to pay, for example, only for an MBB slice but also enjoy the traffic of ultra reliable latency when I feel convenient to do that. Like my son puts on the VR AR glasses without paying it. Yeah, that's a problem. Or may have uh, like, uh, um, yeah, like a, a denial of service attacks on one slice that could practically affect other slice. So what, what, what can I do that to mitigate all, all those possible or potential threats, risks? for my infrastructure. Yeah, if you look at the 3GPP release uh, um, 16, uh, and then later, of course, the 17, they came along with very interesting uh, mechanisms to mitigate the threats I uh, mentioned earlier. And here, there's just examples of uh, how we can achieve this, and what can be supported in practice. Uh, yeah, let, let's go from quickly, very easy. So you have the multi-tenant, they wanna compose their slice. So what you need to do, uh, first of all, you need to authenticate them and uh, authorize them. And that's, that's done now. It can be standardized using the OAuth mechanism. And then you need to encrypt the communication uh, between peers. Now I know who you are. Yeah, let us encrypt our communication. So they didn't transfer. Uh, it cannot be uh, compromised by Another, another play. And then, uh, easy, you may introduce uh, the digital signatures using the X509 certificates, which is what your Chrome uh, nicely supports, that proves that uh, the validity of that particular web interface, it provides you the public key, and you may use it for encrypting uh, your traffic, but in addition, uh, it provides digital signatures. So you are sure that uh, you are really accessing to uh, what you're supposed to do. Then we have the problem of uh, uh, the slice utilization end to end. And here we have two main things to consider. First is that you are uh, accessing a specific uh, network slice and only the slice you are authorized for. And the second, you need to have in place a secondary authentication for accessing the enterprise uh, network, which is beyond the virtual pipe you are creating in your slide. And that's, this is possible because uh, it is uh, introduced uh, the functionality and uh, the NSSAA that comes, you may see here on the screen with uh, authentication and key management in 3GVP. Uh, really 16 that is basically uh, supported uh, by the system. In addition to this, we may encrypt the NSSAI. It's pretty much the identity uh, of uh, uh, this, uh, this slice, net to slice uh, selection assistance information. So it's pretty much the, the stamp that's scaling along the network for setting up uh, and uh, the slice maintaining it and uh, and release it, that's encrypted. And then we may introduce a, a firewall for protection and encryption once we are leaving the public land uh, mobile network. And finally, what is advisable to do and uh, you will need to demand for your vendor to support is uh, the possibility of running your different logical uh, networks, uh, your, your slices possibly into separate uh, network equipment, including isolation in the transport network layer. This is an example that could be achieved uh, with the flex E, that is a function uh, supported by the transport network uh, layer uh, equipment or Huawei that discriminate the different traffic. So you have uh, isolation between these slices achieved through, through the mapping. Similar things, you may think of having a zone and isolation for your virtual machine that a particular communication service may be in one place and uh, like ultra latency communication could be in one place, another, you may think of ultra, sorry, you would enhance mobile broadband services. The other problem is around the massive connectivity. And this is what we're expecting for 5G. So 5G is uh, connecting 
the target is million of devices per square kilometers. And therefore there will be attempts of uh, a number of improper access uh, and stress to both the user plane and the core plane. How do you mitigate that? You need to measure. There's not a, there's a better system than the measuring. So the suggestion is to have uh, native agents. So native capability of in the equipment you buy uh, that would allow you to uh, scrutinize, discriminate, see, trust, Parent, what happened in your network element and trigger the corresponding auction, possibly also demand for algorithm that certain connection could be released and or diverted or offloaded uh, depending on what you measure. Uh, and uh, yeah, to conclude this presentation, I have uh, a very last slide, uh, which is uh, meeting the uh, the second requirement uh, I presented earlier being the third, the uh, security assurance um, on the management. So like uh, having a security uh, operations center that allow you a fast detection response and recovery according to the NIST uh, CFF, CSF uh, best practice. So coming from uh, the US uh, uh, framework uh, targeting the network resiliency. And what you need to have the network, uh, how, how do you achieve this? So first, you need to have in place trust for the equipment, uh, complying with the common criteria, any SAS and any other best practice and the assurance uh, scheme you think of. Yeah, that's the first thing. Second, you need to think of uh, uh, achieving resiliency, resiliency for, from external attack, but more importantly, from internal attacks. That's the problem. Remember that data in use, uh, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to uh, protect, yeah? But we need to target, yes, that one, but especially the data at rest and in transit. That could be achieved by thinking of having in place native agents that transparently can show you what happened into, into your network in terms of configuration, software upgrades, um, traffic, uh, uh, pico traffic, um, um, denial of services, um, installation of malicious software, anything, that's thing. At the same time, you need to have the capability of measuring, analyzing it, possibly with a large degree of automation, because we, we, we can't watch everything. So that artificial intelligence could be uh, uh, in place for pattern recognition and uh, helping uh, the analysis of the data and trigger the corresponding action, which means uh, security control. Security control actions <clears throat> that could be of uh, uh, various types and uh, what the carriers are doing in practice is to provision new security policy uh, uh, once the possible uh, uh, threats are uh, a discovery through the uh, assurance uh, mechanism that put in place into the network. In addition to this, of course, we need to have a configuration management in place that uh, makes it possible for the network operator or administrator in general to uh, configure the parameters, especially the keys uh, and the certificates, identities, anything that has to be set, uh, put in place in alignment with uh, organization uh, policy, strategy, and uh, processes and procedure to uh, achieve uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, resilient uh, system. So that basically concludes uh, my presentation. And uh, Sandy, what do you think? We could have still room for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, David, for a fantastic presentation. You sort of uh, you've given us a comprehensive coverage of any aspects of five G. Uh, what I, uh, I asked uh, everyone if they've got any questions to type them into the group chat on Zoom. So uh, there are about 
five questions there so far uh, and possibly more later, but uh, probably we can start off with, uh, um, David, do you mind taking some questions now? Are you tired or? No, you... it's good. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is from Ashan. He says, uh, with regards to end-to-end -end encryption, uh, how are telcos meant to comply with government mandates where backdoors are to be granted to customer devices while complying with 3GPP security standards? That's the yeah, I think we're, we're, yeah, we are mixing. Uh, uh, many, uh, the question is very complex because uh, I think it brings uh, uh, many aspects, uh, say from, uh, uh, in general, uh, cryptography, uh, which is about uh, encryption and uh, integrity down to uh, discovering of uh, vulnerability, which is about, uh, uh, for example, it is uh, software uh, engineering. So it's completely different, uh, completely different uh, problems and uh, solution to problems. Coming to the encryption, so coming to the confidentiality and the integrity. Uh, if uh, we look at, uh, let's go back to the, sorry, I need an architecture. Um, sorry, yeah, a bit, it's a bit slow. Yeah, I, I could use any, anyway. So what we have here in place is that the 3GPP has uh, nicely, nicely a well-defined all the mechanisms now to achieve an end-to-end -end, um, um, encryption uh, by using different mechanisms at different interfaces so that uh, the traffic crossing that network from PIA, being PIA, a uh, user equipment, down to a PIB, which is another uh, user equipment as defined by the standard, you do have encryption and you do have uh, integrity protection. Like this signal, it is encrypted. Uh, End to end, being uh, the end the terminal, the terminal and down through the core network up to here. Then, when you're leaving this, uh, you have to uh, encrypt at this interface that's all supported. And then the user plane, it is uh, supported in terms of encryption and integrity, the radio interface, and then you need to have in place the security gateway so that uh, brings along your encryption. Uh, across for user plane, control plane, and management plane, so that uh, all your system guarantees the confidentiality and the integrity of the information. Yeah, availability means also uh, diversity, uh, diversity in the supply chain. So that could be achieved by diversifying your supply chain into the redundancy and so forth. The question on vulnerability is a, is a completely uh, uh, different story. It could be a vulnerability uh, uh, defined by uh, a misconduct, misconduct, like say, uh, I, oh, sorry, I've forgotten, apologies, uh, I've forgotten to encrypt uh, your communication from A to B, or sorry, um, we forgot to activate the encryption of uh, the end user data within the uh, uh, UDM platform. Yeah, that's, it's a, it is a, something that it is a vulnerability because of the uh, function is either not supported because of cost saving, usually cybersecurity is always left uh, at the end. So, okay, wait a minute, let me offer this service. Uh, then when I'm, my return on investment is okay, I mean, think of uh, encrypting this, yeah? Uh, yeah, that's just a problem. Or it could be like, there's a problem in the, the procedure, in the process. That, or it could be something like uh, the thinking of this something implanted uh, into, the, into the system that uh, it will, could be started by uh, uh, either an internal player 
or an external prey. How to mitigate that? I think it is also uh, very possible. And in this case, uh, means to introduce, to introduce uh, the, uh, the, the, I mean, you need to have always uh, authentication, authorization and accountability at any interface. If this is in place, uh, there is no way of activating anything which is outside the scope of the legal operation or the organization or through a certified process. On the other hand, there is no, nothing possible to leave the network, the traffic, to be penetrated by the network if I can simply analyze uh, uh, anything in detail that uh, uh, abandon or uh, it is an out outgoing uh, traffic from uh, like an, an open door which I could uh, enter from uh, outside. We can scan all possible door and anything can be identified. If the vulnerability is found, may or may not be a, a big problem. The vulnerability is a problem if it is exploited and not fixed once discovered. Because if it is discovered, could be exploited more rapidly. So it has to be found, fixed immediately. And fixing it is the responsibility of who provides the particular equipment and is also responsibility to immediately upgrade the software by the service provider so that, uh, I mean, may happen, uh, anything can happen, especially say if you look at the software web type of application, your browser, there are many things that uh, uh, could be found within the browser that could embed uh, other software and, uh, and uh, allow people to either steal your data or uh, penetrate within your security control zone. I'm not sure whether I, yeah, because the, the, the question is very, uh, very, um, very complex, but I appreciate that we understand the differences between uh, what has been asked. Yeah. Okay, good. Good, uh, David. Uh, probably you can just, uh, for the next two questions, you can just give very brief answers because we are running out of time. Um, and the next question is from John. He says, so far LTE, including 3G, uh, was using uh, FDD, but for 5G, for example, 3.5 gigahertz band, mostly will use TDD. Why was there such a move? Oh yeah, that's a it's simple reciprocity uh, of the channel estimate. Yeah, this, uh, if you are uh, looking at the uh, MIMO, yeah, let me go back. Uh, sorry, it's not easy to handle the slides, but uh, yeah, if you go to the spectrum, just a bit rapid. So it's because of the channel reciprocity that uh, the, the Massimo, while uh, um, being simple, while uh, orienting, so while defining the, the, the beam towards the end user uh, needs to resolve our formulation. In order to resolve the formulation, needs to know the channel, yes? If the channel is uh, re re there's reciprocity, uh, I could, uh, measure the channel in one way, use also in the other way for making my, it's just because of the channel. Now the technology is improving and you may see also the uh, possibility of uh, deploying Massimo into the FDD. So that means uh, when you need to estimate the channel in both direction, which is much more uh, inefficient. So the reason is because of, uh, main reason is because of the reciprocity of the channel. Let me see if I find the spectrum I presented at the beginning. Okay, that's, and that, and that, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a good that's, answer. That's basically, yeah. Uh, probably the, the third question is from Terence Smith and he wants to know, are you able to comment on 5G system power consumption, including base station compared to 3G and 4G? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't go into, uh, into this uh, detail, but uh, yeah, the, the power consumption has been uh, reduced uh, dramatically. And there are two uh, uh, main reasons. The first reason is that the technology is uh, basically uh, improved. 
improved in, in its design. And if you look at even the, the transmission, uh, we tend to avoid the many conversion from electrical to uh, optical and so forth. So then the interfaces uh, coming with the new radio have been further optimized and designed that you are on air. So you, 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 you are consuming energy. So you transmit, you radiate only when it's extremely needed. So there are mechanisms uh, implemented. So we have improved the protocols. So the way we communicate, how we communicate, the technology in order to perform uh, certain uh, tasks, but we also have dramatically uh, um, reduced uh, um, uh, the size and the way we access to the equipment through automation, and that basically uh, um, using AI and uh, um, analyzing also how those uh, function perform we can further improve, reduce, and shut down certain function of the network that they perform only non-functional tasks not needed in the particular moment. So you can put it down and then only let the uh, communication going through where the traffic is. So yeah, that's basically in high level. And the 5G has, uh, I think, a, a massive improvement. Uh, Perhaps we could organize another talk where we can go through the implementation and here we can understand more of what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, probably I think because of time factor and, and the fact that we are, we've passed our time limit, uh, we, will, we will stop here for today. And um, I will try to pass the other remaining questions to you by email, David. And then uh, thank you. Uh, we will we will stop here for today. And uh, thank you very much again, David, for your fantastic presentation. And uh, I think everyone would uh, has uh, mentioned on the chat that they've enjoyed listening to your presentation uh, and thank the you. of detail it has gone into. So. Um, Yes, uh, so thanks once again. And uh, so we'll stop here for uh, today. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us as well. Thank you so much for hosting me. And uh, goodbye. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Okay, thank you. Bye. Ciao.